Yeah. Um, I think that's a good plan. Yeah. Yeah. Good access. Exactly. Yep. So, have you marked these trees out yet? Mm -hmm. Yes, I've only marked like one tree. I didn't mark because I'm, we're at a point where, in the past, we were marking the hazard trees because it was like this might be hazard. They're clear as a bell. They're dead ash trees, and, and we're really just trying to get them to dead ash trees. Mm -hmm. They have no mark on them. They're ready to fall. So, yep. and like I said, when I didn't want to pigeonhole myself to say. We only want to take these specific trees because when I did that before in Loudon, I came within a few months, the trees beside them were dead. And then I also leave it to where if the customer comes to me and says, hey, I have this one that's dead, um, I just want to take the dead ash trees, hmm. which are clearly the threat to everything. And, and pretty much every live ash tree is going to be dead eventually. But they seem to be going that direction. Yeah. But I'm not really targeting the live ones yet. I know that's the problem with the scenic road is we do it every four years, and because it's scenic road, every time I go in to do so, um, I need to have another hearing. But yeah, so, Ash Ashland marked the trees on Old Tilton Road, and then the markings disappeared. Pulled the ribbons off. Uh, Old Tilton Road is that new to Tilton? Right? New to yeah. Tilton. Yeah. Yeah. Ash. Ash right. was down there marking them. But. Well, typically the process is um, we go through and mark them to identify that we feel these are hazards. And that at that point in time, we then communicate with the landowner saying, these hazard trees we've pre-identified, can we get your permission to remove them? And they may say no. And if they say no, the best policy is to then pull that ribbon off. Hmm. Or if the customer might want it, and more customer will pull the ribbon off. I will tell you that I've had customers take the ribbons off of someone else's tree and put them on their tree, <laughs> <laughs> they would, we would remove their tree. So that is common as well. Because once people learn that the blue Skin check the ribbon means oh, it's going to be a tree geez. coming down for free hmm. and no cost to you, they yeah. And I can tell because they're, they're usually tied together. Yeah. And they're small pieces <laughs> and they're tied up. And I say to them, hey, how did that happen? No. Yeah. <laughs> you guys did it. Yeah. You guys must have run off the <laughs> You did. <clears throat> so are we supposed to inspect these before they cut, or what, what's our job here? Just to tell us, I guess? Your job is just to make sure no one in the town has an issue with what we're doing, and I can't imagine anyone would have a problem with us removing the dead trees. If I can understand if I was coming out and saying there's a couple big, beautiful maple trees that I'd like to remove, then that clearly would be a town issue. At this point, the trees have become just a dead and hazard, and they're not going to get better. There's, you can't, there's no real treatment for them. There's no alternative for it. Um, it just happens to be they're the ash trees, and they're all going from the bore, and they're just, at this moment, dead. So you're not picking on anything else, though? I'm not picking on any other trees. The trees that, that normally I, I would drive down and say, hey, this tree has a really bad leader or that's a multi-stem pine or something like that, we don't, we're not doing that at this time. We're just trying to stay ahead of the dead ash trees. Yeah. And Canterbury really hit really bad. I, I will tell you, it was probably three years ago, or it might be four years ago now, on Asby Road is where it, it really started hitting Mm -hmm. And it came down as we road, and I was hoping it wouldn't go that far, but it, yeah. it yeah. just spreads. Typically, well, concentration started over near the racetrack. And they, and they near the, the racetrack, right? Yeah. Um, the was it four years ago? Fish and Game uh, Arborist came through, and they actually put um, some some kind of wasp down at the Riverland down by Exit 17 yep. as an experiment to see if they could uh, prevent some of the ash trees down there. I don't know, they, and they have, uh, they have traps down there for the borers and stuff, so it's an ongoing uh, project for them. And the state does believe that we aren't gonna lose the ash trees. Yeah. They do believe that hopefully with the wasps, yeah. with the, the, the sucker growth and the mm -hmm. re-immersion of the new ash trees, that they'll hopefully be, in, uh, be still around. They won't be like the chestnut or uh, the elms that will die. Yeah, they because they're a beetle, they can attack them. Yeah. Yeah. They talked about anything, any ash tree over, I don't know, three inches around or four inches around is probably going to be killed, is going to die. Yeah. 
Okay, so the smaller ones, they were hopeful that, that there would be some natural predators <coughs> that could get in and uh, take care of it. Yeah. Hmm. My, my concern, my, my concern is the woodpeckers. Yeah. We are feeding a lot of woodpeckers. Oh yeah. yeah. And I don't oh, know yeah. where they're going when they're done with the ash trees. I don't <laughs> they're going they're to the good. pines and poplars. So yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping they're flying wherever they're going. But <laughs> man, I'm surprised we aren't seeing clouds of them. But yeah. there are a yeah. lot of ash trees here. Yeah. Yeah, the and havoc on our trees. Yeah, well, the, the ashes are feeding them. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it, it seems like it's coming to an end. It does, but I know there's plenty of ashes in the forest, and there's still plenty of ashes around here that aren't mm -hmm. affected. Usually, they said the forest because it's so small. Right. It could be in that tree for three years before you right. even notice it. Right. By the time you notice it, it's usually yeah. too late. Yeah. And I know Schaefer Village, for instance, that they had big ash. It was, it was pretty good, and then all of a sudden, within that year, it died and all the bark fell off it <laughs> really quickly. Really yeah, they got some big ones up there. Yeah, and that was a really big ash. And, yeah. um, so do you need permission from us? or do you just I, This is a scenic road hearing. You just need to give me the permission, or it's usually yeah. for the town, uh, to go forward with doing the tree work as proposed on the scenic roads. So moved. All second? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. We Thank you. will start back to Sill Road hopefully tomorrow. We'll start uh, clean that. And then, if you, as soon as I hear, we're not. Yeah. Really, we we get a lot of construction jobs, but when we start moving wood around, uh, if you could just let me know that that's a go. Yep. We'll do our best to start piling wood there. All right. I'll see you Friday. 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 Have a great day. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you. Good night, Brian. You don't see anything for a problem up there, do you? I do not. So that year, what are you, three years ago? Yeah. Four years ago? Three years ago. And I don't even remember where we got the wood from, but somebody donated somebody, yeah, a yeah. bunch of log length wood, cut it, split it, and then we delivered it to town residents. It was gr a great program, huh. um, it, which we happily did. So I'm sure we'll happily do it again. So we're not going to entertain yeah, chainsaws. I brought, I brought my split over there. And Chainsaws. Yeah, we're not going to see chainsaws arriving in pickup trucks to do this, or is it only oh, God, yes. Huh? To yeah. cut to cut up yeah, what right. after they deliver the law. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's right. I, I. I mean, there was. So one person did call me. Yep. Asked me if he could take the ones around uh, Kimball Pond, and I said, gotcha. "So it's not my position, I guess, but you got my." Yeah. Say so to go ahead. I saw one guy, I don't know who he was, but yeah. I assume. Well, then it just, guy. it seems with the other people. I know some that ended up on Old Tilton Road, and I don't know gotcha. where the rest of it went. Yeah. Not in my yard. Yeah. No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, mine neither, so. All right. Moving right along. Yep. short coming in at 545 but uh, until then you got uh, some things to sign here which is all in there we have a manifest that's the accounts payable accounts payable manifest in the amount of five hundred twenty six thousand nine hundred thirty seven dollars twenty two cents so moved I will second. Ken, do you want this back or do you want me to just go to the file? Uh, just take a file. There's yeah. a system.
Next we have uh, elderly exemption. <coughs> Do you need the name? Tax map and lot number three. Tax map and lot. Map 240, lot 11. Thank you. We need a we don't motion this or? No. by Peach to the Solid Waste Committee and Carol Veenstra Blavin to the Solid Waste. Oh, another one. Leanne Matt, Mackey. And then Madeline Lowe. And then we have Bob Steenson for the Conservation Commission member. And Lance Messenger. Conservation Commission. Oh, perfect, thanks. I'll talk to uh, the chief tonight. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure he'll, uh, yeah. he'll be in favor of that. So it's a good, good thing for the community. So. Yes. For signatures, for so you're on the account for the. Linda and Scott. Oh. Why am I not for something? Oh. <coughs> Cheryl is a part on the second page. I think you need to come up as well. Just it just needs one signature. On oh, the very okay. bottom. Yep. I think it's for the payroll account, the eight house payable, and. The
Yeah. Yeah. You can take that if you want. Perfect. Actually, I'll, uh, I don't really need the letter, but it's got the curve. So I'll, right I'll right grab that and give that to you, Mike. Perfect. Yep. Thank you. Signed everyone for the sign. action on your part, but it's pretty straightforward in letter. So um, very fun informational thing to start out with is the Deep Woods project. Thank you. Maps. So you can see where it is. Up there in red. Uh, this is a property owned by Ken Lennon and Stern. Oops, I didn't sorry, I have to share it. You want to take this one side? Sure, thanks. Um, so this is our latest conservation project. It's uh, There's a little bit that sticks over into Northfield, but it's nearly 400 acres total. And it's being, um, the conservation easement is being managed or put together by Five Rivers Conservation Trust, which is our preferred way to do projects so that the town isn't on the hook for the permanent uh, monitoring and enforcement of the easement. And we have, uh, the Conservation Commission has voted to expend $36,943 from our land use change tax fund. Um, and this will go to the Forest Society, 
to pay for specific um, project costs to help them make this project happen. <clears throat> so we're really excited. It's a great piece of property with um, a lot of wildlife. Um, the Stearns have already created some trails on it and are working on creating more. They're going to put in a little bit of parking. The idea is you know, it will be totally publicly accessible and people will be encouraged to go out and enjoy it. Cool. So it's a great project. Yep. This is the one off Ham Road or no, Bean Hill? Bean Hill. Bean Hill. Bean Hill. Yep. Bean Hill. I have not yet been out there. Um, the total project cost is $286,943. And as I said, our contribution is just under $37,000. So I didn't bring the percentage, but it's a pretty minor percentage. So we're stretching our dollars by, by working with the private um, land conservation groups. <clears throat> and we had um, a public hearing about the project at our last meeting because when we give money to qualified entities, we're allowed to do that. We voted at a town meeting years ago that we could do that, but every time there's a project, we have to have a public hearing and we did. So can I ask a question? You may. Did you post that somewhere? Or yeah, I put it in the monitor and it was posted to the town. On the website? or? I don't know if it was on the website, but it was in the monitor and in two places in town. Okay, I, I didn't pick up on it. It's not your fault necessarily, but you spent a lot of town money without at least a selectman being there. But I, I just, I think if you could publicize it a little better, that would, that would make it feel a little more comfortable. Stearns are contributing a significant amount of um, uh, toward the project just to make it viable. They had had some originally some um, fun funding plans for it that turned out to not work for the project. So the Stearns increased the amount that they were contributing by taking less than the fair market value for the easement. They're, they're taking $145,000 less than fair market value for the project. Did this include the cemetery up there, or is that outside the bounds of this? Uh, let's see. Ken has not mentioned the cemetery. So Ham so Cemetery is up there. I um, don't know. Bean Hill Cemetery. Right? I can ask Ken if you'd like. I, I'm not sure because I don't see a road. I see a brook, but I don't see a road. Either. I can. This map is only have one of these. It's. More details and marks a lot of uh, what's on the property. I don't see anything named the cemetery. Right. Where's Where's the road in relationship to this? I think this is the road. Okay. No, no I'm going to include that then. It's probably down here somewhere. Yeah. excited about that. We hope to get the project, so they hope to get the project closed this summer, and then we'll do some kind of an event to celebrate and invite people out to take a walk around. How many acres are there? Um, it is almost 400. I think it's mm -hmm. 385 that will have um, one type of easement, and then another small portion will have another second type of easement on it. But it's a significant, it's one of our larger conservation yeah. projects, so very exciting. Looks pretty wet out there, huh? Like I said, I haven't been out myself. I suspect it's got a lot of, um, you know, typical Canterbury terrain, yeah. <laughs> the wet spots and the high ledgy spots. Source is replacing poles on one of the on both on all of the poles on one of the lines and some of the poles on another of the line. They came in, uh, presented to us about their wetland permit, all of which seemed perfectly in order. We have no issues with it, um, but they did um, 
So they're they're trying to minimize their impact where possible by using <coughs> sometimes the less impactful way to access the poll is not through their right of way, but say through a neighbor's right of way. So where they have wanted private access access to private land, they've contacted the landowner and asked for that. Um, and they would like to have access to some town land on our Sawyer's Ferry parcel, and they describe it as being about a um, hundred feet long and twenty feet wide. And this is in an area where we just did a, um, a timber harvest a couple of years ago. Conservation Commission has no problem giving them that access. They'll use they'll cross our property to get to an abutter's property to get to a pole and avoid wetland. So that's what we like. Um, so. We, we're totally okay with that, but really giving permission to use townland, I think, is your responsibility rather than ours. <laughs> um, and uh, so I'm forwarding, you know, our, our advice is please give them the go ahead for that. And I think I forgot to bring, so I will email Ken with the contact person. Yes. Alex, I, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I think I have that because they sent it to me. And, then, and, and, I, and I think I sent it to you guys because uh, I knew, and it, or maybe I was included on it, but yeah. I think I have that. Okay. Yeah. I think it's Alex Green, but I can mm -hmm. I will send you the contact information. They they have a real estate department that writes up little legal, you know, mini contracts. We've got that whole package right. too. we got a copy of that yeah. package. Um, and I could try and figure out and show you where on this map it is, but I'm not sure it would really mean anything to you. Um, I think the, the important point is it's 100 feet, 20 feet wide, they're going to avoid a wetland, and that would be our preference in any case. So uh, Sumner owns the piece across the road, or where is Sumner Dole's property, do you know? Where's, so where's this site? The, the Sawyer's Ferry, I think, runs through Sumner's property, doesn't it? I don't know. I mean, the, the town's parcel, Sawyer's Ferry so parcel. It's on the other side. So mm -hmm. Yeah. Some of the south property side. is on the north side yeah. okay. of Intervale Road. The town's is on the south side. Okay. Yeah. Just trying to yeah. mm. I, I, I should spend years walking around <coughs> town with the tax maps learning who owns what, but I haven't, I haven't done that, so I didn't even know the owns that property down there. All right, that was number two. Um, number three, and again, it's informational, but um, as you know, all over town, private property, town property, there are lots of problems with invasives, invasive species, and the Conservation Commission has pretty traditionally been loath to use any kind of herbicides to try and deal with them. Uh, but we had a presentation back in our December meeting by, um, uh, she brings down, Seigen, uh, Doug Seigen, who's the, um, who works for the state, and essentially uh, it, he's, he runs their herbicide program, what to use, where to use it, when to use it, how to use it. So he came in, as, as did Chris Kane, who is the conservation professional that we hire to monitor all of our conservation easements. And they talked, basically, they brought, they brought us about 20 years up to date in understanding. So what Doug has done with um, his experiments with herbicide use, like along, for the DOT, for along the highways and such, he has um, experimented on how di he, he's increased the dilution. He's, he's reduced the intensity of the herbicide, trying to find where is that point, like how far can you dilute it and still have it be effective. And he's also, believe it or not, um, the recommendation for some of the herbicides is to mix them with um, a petroleum project, pro product, which adding petroleum in addition to the herbicide, is definitely not desirable. So he has substituted, I believe it was canola oil, it was some kind of vegetable oil. Um, and he's had very good success with this new formula of his, so oil instead of petroleum, and a significant reduction in the intensity of the herbicide. And then his, his recommended strategy in most cases is different for different problems in different places, but cut it, fairly low to the ground, but not all the way, and then you paint what's there. Just very direct application, not broad foliar, spl foliar spraying, but you know, the, hit the specific things you want to get rid of. 
Um, and he's very interested in helping us do a little experiment down on the Riverlands um, in the parking lot. I think when the town first took ownership of the property, created the parking lot. So I'm not sure how well you all know this, but the um, it's a complicated situation in which the town owns some land outright, and then there's the private owners own their property, but in some cases we have easements across their property, et cetera. So um, there's <clears throat> the parking lot, and then there's a fence, and then there's the big field. And the town, thinking to help keep people from driving into the big field, I think, was the rationale, put a row of very large boulders there, which means you can't mow it. You can't really do anything to tame it. Um, and so a 180 foot long, 20 foot high, 15 foot deep jungle of invasives has grown there. Um, and then the invasives wind themselves into the fence um, and get into the field, which of course our, our neighbor doesn't like for good reason. Um, and she would like us to be more aggressive about trying to resolve this problem. Um, and she, she's also concerned about whether herbicides is the correct thing to do or not. So we need to talk with her to, to explain what we think we can do to try and control this um, and <coughs> see if we can reach a place where she's content with what we would like to try to do. But it's, it's complicated. First we have to get those boulders out of there before we can hack the stuff down. Um, and then there would be this experimental application of herbicide. Um, so I guess I'm just bringing that to you because it's a bit of a change of direction for the Conservation Commission, and I'm sure that won't be the only property where we decide this is, you know, um, where there's a plot of invasives and we want to try and do that. What we are advised is trying to get rid of the seed source, that is kill the productive plants so that the birds can't take those seeds and just keep spreading them everywhere, is important for trying to control it or tame it. Um, it's not going to get rid of it. <laughs> that, that's not going to happen. Um, but I wanted to share that with you and see if you had any questions or concerns. It is a mess. I walked around down there. Yeah, it's a mess. Um, I don't know what we would do with the stones if we took them out of there. Dump them somewhere else? Or? Well, oh, they're pretty oh, big. Uh, are they, yeah. Yes. Is it like excavator size? Or so, yeah, um, some not, not something our backhoe would probably pick up. Yeah. We're going to need a, a bigger machine, I think. Mm -hmm. so. I asked Kevin Bragg if he could <laughs> do it, and he said it was too big for his machine. Yeah. yeah. So we're checking with John Carr to see if he might be able to. This is, we got a price, I don't remember from whom, but um, somebody gave us a price of $6,000 last year to remove these boulders, which is, you know, is six tenths of our budget, mm -hmm. <laughs> and not something we had all planned on. So we're trying to find somebody who can work with us at a price we can afford to, to uh, remove the boulders. So you're just going to try and get it so you can mow along there and then? The idea would be, yeah, to make it mowable. And then when the path gets mowed down to the beach, we can also mow our side of the fence. You'll see the landowner can mow her side of the fence. Is and she maintaining her side of the fence? She's, no? she's working very hard to get rid of the invasives in her property. And it's, it's a struggle, but she's working very hard at it. Our highway department went down there a couple of years ago and we cut on one side. Mm -hmm. This would be the east side of the fence. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at pulling the parking lot mm -hmm. to the left, where the oh. fence runs down that yeah, way. The, there was go, some, going toward the beach. Was, nope, the no, other way. The the, the opposite from the river. Oh, okay. There was some trees in there that were hanging out mm -hmm. over and they were in danger of taking down the fence. So our guys went down there with uh, the, and they took the chipper. And they cut the trees and the chipper. Chipped them. Um, but, right. So they've been down through there. So they yeah. are familiar with it. Struggle. I certainly don't have a solution for it. Okay. You're doing a good job. Yeah, we're <laughs> trying. We're trying. It's um, <clears throat> yeah. It's not my favorite thing to have to think about, but it's reality. All right. Um. So okay, another informational thing. It's it's a it's a landmark moment. Um. 
when Bob Fife's current term, previous term on the Conservation Commission expired in March of 22, no, 23, sorry, just expired. And when I asked him if he wanted to serve another term, he said no. Which, my friends, is the first time in 50 years he has said, he's going to stay involved and do what he can, but he doesn't feel like, um, mostly because of his hearing issues, he can participate in the meetings very effectively. So that's a big moment for the Conservation Commission. I was going to say just um, dedicating next year January 14, but somebody told me we, we did that at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yep. so there's that. Um, I don't know. Do you all want to say anything to him or write him a note of thanks and appreciation for his long time service? Well, again, when the weather's good and the bugs aren't biting, mm -hmm. we probably have a walk um, somewhere, maybe in this field, and have a little thank you event for him. I'll let you know where it is. <clears throat> okay, and now this brings us to, I think, my last and most confusing item. Um, you know, the Martins house that right on Kimball Pond Road between the Robert Escott Conservation Area and the pond and the road. Um, they have uh, a huge white pine came down in their backyard uh, the last or like a week and a half ago. Unfortunately, it didn't hit their house. It kind of went sideways instead of uphill. Good. Um, but that got them looking at the very big pines that are right on the property line between the Robert and Spike Conservation Area and their property. Um, so I brought some pictures. walk you through what you're looking at. The first picture um, is from across the road as, as you're looking at their house. Those are the big pines. And that first one on the left, it, it starts out about this high off the ground. It turns into a double trunk tree. And then, I don't know, four or six feet higher, each of those trunks turns into a double mm -hmm. trunk. The thing has got to be 15 feet around at the base. These are yeah. big, big big tree, and it, so it has four tops, and it's up there. Um, and then uh, picture number two, I moved so that I'm facing down that sort of um, the, the road, the access way between the stump, the stone walls, and the town, the property line, if you look at number four, number three, sorry, <clears throat> that's the pin, right smack in the middle of the uh, stone line, stone wall on the, the, you know, there's a stone wall on the left and the right, so we're looking at the stone wall on the left. The pins have gone a little crooked, but if you stood it up straight, it's right there in the middle of the rock. Looking down, there's, that's one side of the really big tree. Um, picture four is just the same thing from a little bit further back. Flip it over. <coughs> picture five is that big tree. First it's a double tree and then it's a quadruple tree. <laughs> And it's, it, uh, you know, this n number six, I, I stood on the stone wall to the picture, and there's the tree, you know, one foot in each side of the stone wall, essentially. Um, <clears throat> number seven is another angle of the stone wall, just showing how, I mean, the tree showing how close it is to structures in their yard, <coughs> and also very close to the house. And then number eight is the next tree down, which is just a single trunk tree standing up, but again, growing straight out of the stone wall. Um, the Martins would like to have these trees taken down, which I totally understand. The Conservation Commission doesn't object to that. Um, the Martins would like to not have to pay for it. Um, so I know I've never addressed anything like this. Um, the trees, to my eye, seem to be growing pretty much on the property line. Um, and it certainly doesn't seem worth the cost of like getting an, a, a, a surveyor out there to figure out who owns more of the tree. Um, I was wondering if we could propose sharing the cost with them, uh, or what your advice is on how to proceed. The, we have not budgeted for this, certainly wasn't planning on it. Um, and when they, when uh, Lagoon was there to take that, to chop up the tree that had fallen down for them, 
he looked at these two trees and gave for a price of $3,500 each to remove them because there's a lot there. <clears throat> it's also going to require, um, as she explained it to me, the space between the stone walls is too rugged for their equipment to go in and work from there, so they're actually going to have to probably remove um, some like mature lilacs or something from her yard to create the space to work from to get to the trees. This is on Martin's property. On the Martin's property. We've got a couple of these size trees up around the Shell Meeting House Cemetery. What we're proposing up there is to drop them onto these abutters property mm -hmm. and to limb them up. And that's going to be somewhere around 850 or more per tree. Mm -hmm. It leaves the butt and everything else in place, which leaves a mess. Mm -hmm. Place that we're looking at, it's not going to probably matter where this looks like it would make a mess on the, your property. And I mean, if you drag them over with a cable, which is, I would certainly be thinking about that. The 3600 uh, that's what it cost us to take these maple trees down up here when we did those big ones. Mm. That included him cleaning it all up. It, it, it meant he could actually get in there, which I'm, I'm agreeing is he's not going to drive the truck down there. No. And I don't. So, you guys own the property to the north of this, then? Yes. Yeah. yeah. We own the property. It's we own the us. town. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's, not, it's not Harry Kinter's. Or, no. Yes, yeah. it's ours. <clears throat> um. How many trees are there? Well, I think uh, Lagoon was suggesting that the two that are that are pictured on the line. Um, in the one, the one in, in picture seven and picture eight, uh, they both lean slightly toward the house, um, are the ones that need to come down. Yeah. And I don't know what to, whether to, count, to tell you that that tree number seven is one, two, or three, or four mm. trees, but it's, yeah. it's big. It's a lot of wood. Um, and then there's, there's actually another very tall, equally tall uh, one on the um, curling in, out of the uh, stone wall to the north, like the next stone wall over, but I think they're not seeing that as a threat. No. So we're looking at over seven grand to take these two trees out of there. Yeah. We don't have a budget for this at all, do we? No. We have a we do have a tree cutting line and a budget up front. <coughs> Do we have any kind of a just generic emergency contingency, oops, this is a problem we didn't know was going to happen fund? <laughs> we, we have some for the center. We have, we have town building emergency, the, mm -hmm. the yeah. cap is on the town, the town building. But, but that's restricted. Nothing for this. Um, I know you had sent me an email, asked if uh, our liability carrier would and I spoke to our representative the other day, and he he would, was going to check with our, the liability department, but he didn't think it would. Well, yeah. Yeah. If the tree fell and crushed their house, then, well, they, then, then they'd help us out. And I get it, that's, yeah. but that's what they do. That's an insurance you know? Yeah. <laughs> My brother's insurance company, homeowner's insurance company, sent a letter saying they were going to, they were taking the insurance away because he had too many trees around his house. They didn't even give him an option to take him down. Wow. They said, you're done. <laughs> wow. Trees, who knew? I think not. Um, uh, the way I understand it is the land use change tax fund was designated for the purchase of conservation and easements rather than the maintenance of the land. Good question. Mm. On the plus side, we did contribute $24,000 to the general fund last year mm. from our timber sale. 
we could just rescue that out. Would be awesome. <laughs> so you know, we'd still be ahead if we if we. Uh... Yeah, yeah, we only have three thousand dollars in the tree line. Mm -hmm. the tree line. How much? Three. Three. Okay. And we could get them down for a lot less money, but it just creates a mess. Is what we do. Mm -hmm. Save it till another year, though. I, well, I suppose we can save the cleanup, um, but um, since the, the, the they have three big pines in their backyard and one came down, and I think these pines are all of the same age, and with this much rain coming down, I'm really not feeling very good about it, because um, that's when these big guys just kind of get tired and tip over. So. Um, I, I, I don't know if you were suggesting doing the trees in different years, but I, I think that's the thing. No, I was thinking if we could pull them over for under a grand type of thing a piece and just drop them, mm -hmm. right? So they're not threatening the, the house anymore. Right. They're not going to go anywhere, but they're going to make a mess till we clean them up, which is going to be, yeah. you can't get equipment in there. That's yeah. I, I don't, I've never seen or experienced that method, and so I, I mean, it would, um, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't look to see like what if because we have to pull them to the north so they weren't threatening the house. <coughs> um, if that, if there's enough just generic, excuse my language, crappy woods there that you know we could let them fall there and let them disintegrate there. Um, you can see if you look at picture one, you see some of the get a sense of some of the distance from the trees to the north. Uh, there's, there might be a little bit more before you get to the Kinter's garden. Do you want me to go down and look at it, or do we want to look at this, or just ignore it? Well, I, I, I think uh, you have two options. You can look at it and try and figure out where we can find the money, or see about, and if they make it through next year, do a warrant article and or, pro, or put, put the budget line higher in the tree line or something like that. Is it try and top it out for a year and see what happens or, or try and find the money from someplace else in the budget? I can understand that. You're looking at probably, you know, we have 3,000 and you're looking at trying to find another four somewhere. those things you have to look at and decide what you're going to do. Well, we know one of them came down already, so there's a, certainly potential for yeah. another one. And it they is make me nervous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, you know, $7,000 seems like a huge amount of money in for a tiny little budget, um, but then, and to the town, but um, the, uh, the property damage, not to mention the potential for life damage, uh, injury and death, if the trees come down on the house while somebody's sleeping in their bedroom upstairs, are just, you know, that makes $7,000 look like nothing to me. Well, and you did mention at one point that they were willing to split the cost with us. No, no, I suggest, oh, I, I, suggest I'm, okay. I'm thinking <coughs> that since the trees seem to be very much on the property line between the two, and that, um, no previous owner of the of that property of the of what is now the Martins property, you know, at any time in the last hundred years while these trees were growing, said, "Hey, these really ought to come down." I feel like maybe it's reasonable to to suggest that we cost share on it. I have done that with some of the cemeteries, and it, it generally worked out for us. So. Cost sharing within a butter to do something. Yeah, that's nice. You know, we've taken trees this big down. When you when you mentioned taking down the trees at the cemetery, uh, it, are we hiring are you hiring a contractor for that or so? Yeah. Yeah, Kent doesn't do that. No, no, mm -hmm. I didn't think it actually be Kent. No. Um, too old, too fast. Right, and you know we could contact other tree people who do tree work. Um, you, you can. My experience has been that Brian's the least expensive mm -hmm. typically in that situation. So. Okay. But you're right. You Brian did some work for us over here on this cemetery, and he'd come in at four or five grand, I forget which, and selecting one to get some more pricing. So I asked, 
aspirin and Bartlett or one of those guys. Mm -hmm. They were more than twice as much. Wow. And that was because they could get the, uh, <coughs> a crane over it, which I don't know if you could do that. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's going to be a difficult site. Yep. Yeah. I think you, you might be thinking of, because Suzanne mentioned removing, that he suggested removing her lilacs to get in on her property, so maybe there is a space in her yard where he could set up the crane. Okay. Uh, but I don't, I don't know, I'm just speculating. Yeah, that's still going to be the $3,500 yeah. 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 right. well, Where the tree is on the property line, it could be a shared expense would be... Yeah. I, I, we could almost do it this year. Well, it, I that. think yeah. probably could find some money somewhere to This is a non am I the negotiator? Is Ken? Is it should we invite the Martins to come to the to a meeting? Uh, I mean, inviting them to a meeting is a difficult thing in some ways, right? Yeah. I think I I think I mean I don't mind reaching out to them and saying that, that okay. at this point, see if we can come up with a, a plan. Yeah. See what his thoughts are on it. Go from there. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
if I looked at the yeah, the process, I could probably tell. Like people like old by the conservation. Yeah, but that's good. date anymore, but just to remind you all that this map shows all the conservation properties in town, and they're, they're with five different colors, so that you can differentiate the ones that the town owns the property outright, uh, the ones where the town owns the property and somebody else has a conservation easement, like the fish and game or something. Um, private land, where the town owns an easement private land where it's a third party like a land trust or the or the uh, agency. Um, oh, and the, the last one is just other towns adjacent conservation land. So we have four categories. So I'll go home and take a look at that and look at look at this and see if I can tell you what the <laughs> what the asterisk is defined. <laughs> Um, just to go back to one on the question of the herbicide use, um, do you want me to just send Ken a note and then when we kind of identified what a project would be and where it would be and when it would be? We're also thinking about, um, to the extent that we can though, it's time consuming trying to use it as a public education opportunity to say to people that um, nobody wants to do it this way, but it's the only way to try and gain some control. And when and we had that meeting, um, when Doug Sagan was speaking with us, we had two uh, master gardeners from town attended the meeting, and they seemed totally in favor of, of this approach. Um, and so I'm feeling like the, 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 uh, the tide is turning, that people's attitude is we have to do something, and with the experiments Doug has done to make it so much less of a impact, um, it's got to be tried. So has he been working with like uh, knotweed or bittersweet? Or I think he's dealt with everything. Okay. Yeah, all of them. You know, when you get popcorn. one of the problem areas that I see is in the creamery road, right? That's covered mm -hmm. with the Rugosa rose or whatever it yeah. is. And it's got a lot of that uh, bittersweet up on the old tilt road end of it. Mm -hmm. you've, you've got, so what's starting to come up? I think is that we've got a group of people that are forming around the center project here. Uh -huh. yep. And it might be a, something where we could work together on that. Mm -hmm. If the land is right, right. Right. And we're we're only dealing with the town land. We're not, you know, obviously not going to be doing any herb siding on any private land. Um, there was just so you know, if you're thinking about inv treating invasives, um, when we <coughs> were first talking about some ways to tackle the problems down at the Riverlands. There is a, um, a gentleman in Vermont who I think is a forester, but he's also customized some of his machinery to specifically do invasives removal. Like he, he can apparently uproot tremendous amounts of the stuff. Um, and he had some projects he's done in New Hampshire that were fresh, he had just done them, so we were waiting to see like, three years later, five years later, how are they doing? Um, and of course, there's not only the expense of hiring somebody to do the removal, you have to seed it and maintain that seeding, you know, and mow it, and, and go back and do hand removal of any of the sprouts that are coming back. So it's an intensive process, um, even, even if you start with a big mechanized removal but that's another option as well. Should, should we talk to John about those rocks and see if there's anything? Yeah, I have a note. I just I wrote myself a note to check with John. Oh, thank you. Just to see what his, his thoughts on yeah. those are. And, you know, I also don't know what, like, my assumption is we hire somebody and say, the job is pick them up and get them out of here. We don't care what you do with them, but take them off of our property. Because if we just move them, like, to the other side of the parking lot right. and push them into the woods there, it's going to be the same, same problem. Yeah. Yeah. So that, but that in itself is going to be a problem because didn't we run into this earlier about carrying uh, 
invasives over the roads, and I don't believe it's legal. Well, it's this just just be the rocks. Just be the boulders. No, you know? I know. I'm talking about the invasives, though. You said that guy come in and ripped them out by the roots, right? Right, and he, then he had different uh, ways of doing the cleanup. I'm not sure it is illegal to. Well, we heard it was, and then yeah. it, we we said we'd accept the stuff up at the dump to burn, uh. right? Because otherwise, we don't want it seen strewn along the side of the road. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I can easily find out the answer to that. And I, I, I doubt it. I could be very wrong. We won't hold you to it if you are. All right, I will check. Illegal to be. Could be, could be illegal to put it on somebody else's I, property. I think, I think you can transport it as long as it's for disposal purposes. Okay. It's not, you can't like transport it to transplant it somewhere. Right. But just grinding this stuff up probably isn't going to solve the issue. It's going to have to be burned. I can, um, I'll go back and find the information from the guy in Vermont who talked about his ways of dealing with it. And I, um, and Doug has done a massive project at, I think, at Odeorn State Park, which had a huge invasion, and they beat it way back. Hmm. Um, so there's some success, but it takes you know, diligence and time and money to I think we yeah. checked with uh, Wheel of Raider or whatever they are now, mm -hmm. and they said they did not want to take it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we took the stuff that we took out behind the town hall and here up to the dump and burned it. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. All right, any other questions for conservation while I'm here? I don't think so. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Oh, thank you for appointing Bob pointing him again to the conservation commission and you got my request for the um for lance and for yeah they signed the appointment yeah, they oh they did lance yeah. and bob lance, lance and bob oh yeah lance and bob last time it was me mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for me <laughs> thanks for your time we can we let me know what you what comes in your conversation i will all right great Thank you. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. What email do you want us to Yep. Yes. Yep. Sam? Mr. Walker. Mr. Bobo. I've read it already. Yeah. 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 So we're working on Shell Meeting House Cemetery. We're working on selling plots and like to see if we're will we how we can split that cost of lot sales. How we can use some of that money to continue these historic preservation projects that we're we're building on. So we did put some money, or trustees did put some money into the budget for uh, tree removal and what else did we put in there? Headstone repair. Headstone repairs. Yep. Um, we should have put more in. And I think what they're suggesting is that we sell some of those lots up there, give the town a piece of the action, and then put the rest of it back towards uh, some of the things that we we got trees that are as big as these right here really? that ring that cemetery. <coughs> there are six of them. But we're proposing just to pull them over and limb them in place. No. I'm guessing that's still the plan. Or yeah, the property owners are in agreement. They're in agreement, yeah. And Brian has given at least a number for two of them. Um, John, you were going to check and get some more pricing, or have you done that? I haven't done it, and I'm not planning to. I think it would help if we had a second number first. Okay. But if you tell me that I should, then I will. When Captain Dixon took over cemeteries from Selecta in 1962 or 1963, we had a cost, a way 
to sell the lot so that money would be going back into the cemetery. Right. And since we've discontinued putting money into the professional care and putting money into that improvement fund, there's no way for us to put any of that money back towards the cemetery no. itself. And so that's what I'm working on here is that we can be putting more money back towards the cemetery to be sort of self-sustaining. <laughs> this is just the show me just how kidding. cemetery. Just yeah. <laughs> but, um, again, I'm open to, to whatever we're we're talking about four hundred dollars for the space. Um, <coughs> you folks see that maybe if you want to split it up differently, I'm open to suggestions on that. I just threw that out there to give an idea of how we could share that cost. So uh, I'm in favor of doing this. I'm one of the reasons that we switched away from um, putting the, one of the reasons was that uh, I, as a, as a cemetery trustee at the time, didn't want to have to go through an audit on whatever money's come out of that. And I, I guess I'd like to understand how that would work as far as you guys see it. Because somebody's going to have to look and say, yes, that money went to where it was supposed to go, right? Or do we just trust the, the, the trustees to do this? I, I, what do you guys think? There should be an accounting right there. Right. Yep. Z. Yeah. 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 So um, if we can figure that part of it out, I'm fine with, with doing this. I, you know, it either comes out of our pocket now or it comes out of it next year. So. Yeah. It could be a, a report to the that's part of the town report that lists the lots that are sold, how many were sold, and the income to the 501c3 yeah. and the income to the town. I, it yes. probably could be as simple as that of bookkeeping. Okay. Um, I don't, I, you're not talking enough money here to really require a financial right. audit. It costs more for the audit than it would that you make the money on. So I think probably, uh, you know, I mean, we, we depend on our department heads to spend their money accordingly. And I think the trustees are elected officials, and hopefully they can be, um, the town depends on them to spend the money accordingly yeah. and to record it accordingly. So I think that's, that's an, enough to satisfy any questions of, of financial responsibility. Okay, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I just want to hear you. Yeah, yeah, basic balance sheet. Balance sheet. Yeah. 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 yeah, just a balance Absolutely. sheet, and, then, yeah. and we can make it part mm -hmm. of the town report, yeah. and that would be that should satisfy any questions. Do we need to vote on this, or do we just say, go ahead and do it? I don't know that you have to vote on it. Can we just clear before we start? Accounting yeah. and billing here, so we should be fine. Yep, we can do that. Other cemetery questions while you got us in front of you? sheets that we have been discussed for the secretaries of some various boards. Um, I think, uh, let's see, one, two, and one, three, you. This is just a simple spreadsheet I've put together um, from the time sheets, just so you can see uh, the times and, and money that was spent on on administrative and minute uh, duties of the various boards. Um, and at the bottom, you can see the cost per meeting. Um, I guess I, I, I did it that way. Um, there isn't that much big of a difference in the cost per meeting. However, 
there is a, a fairly significant workload difference between the, the secretary's duties yep. of, of those different boards. So um, I, we had originally scheduled to have the ZBA chair in tonight, but because of uh, some health issues, we didn't, I decided not to do that. So we're putting, putting that off. But I thought I'd at least give this, this background information. So okay. we have it. Um, yep. And I have copies of all the timesheets if anybody's interested in or whatever. So um, for details, you can give me a call and I'll, yeah. I'll give you the, the details if you need them. So, but I thought I'd give you that that uh, backup on it anyway, at least to, to get you started. And, and technically, we hire this person. She's yeah, yeah. The the they're. They're paid by the Board of Selectmen, so, so they are, so, right. Yeah. I mean, we're just gonna look at this and put it down for the night, right? right. Yeah, that's, it's just like I say, it's a background for you and, and, uh, and, and um, you know, I think the, the original idea was to have the chairs of the boards come in and discuss the differences of costs and, and whether it's whether you feel it's a, a, a good deal for the for the town or not. So. Okay. Um, the next thing is the uh, I have the broad a broadband update. Um, so I sent letters out to uh, all of our state reps. Uh, state senator, our, our three representatives for the House, the um, city of Warmington, our executive counselor, and the governor. And um, got replies from everybody except for the governor. <laughs> it's kind of surprised me, but whatever. Um, but I got a phone call from the one of the people that works for well, I sent. I also sent a, a copy of the letter to the commissioner of the New Hampshire Business and uh, Economic uh, Development Administration. They're the ones who um, who are handling the grants, uh, the BMG and brick money and stuff. So um, they said that uh, the interim rules from the federal government expired July 4th. They are trying to get those, uh, the, the, the permanent rules, not the interim rules, uh, before the July 4th deadline, so they can try to get the grants administered, the rest of the 2.5 million, or, or 25 million, excuse me, uh, administered out. Um, that was, 25 million is the initial amount of money uh, that was uh, committed. There is an additional 40 million that's available if they feel they need more. Um, so they're waiting for those rules from the federal government to be established. And um, their plan was, they already sent out, they have awarded two grants already one to Consolidate, one to the New Hampshire Electric Co-op, and that was to get the uh, biggest bang for the buck. They got a lot of people uh, that, that don't have any access, um, access. And um, now they're hopefully that they can work on towns like Canterbury, Loudoun, Pittsfield, um, that, don't, that don't have that last mile of connection. So that's what they're working on, that's where they are. Uh, I relayed this information to our representative Comcast. Uh, he thanked me. Um, and at this point, it's still just kind of a waiting game to see when the federal government approves the final rules. Um, and I said, well, since the interim rules expire July 4th, why don't you just send, send the applications out now? And he felt that the time wasn't the time between now and July 4th wasn't enough to 
accept applications, get all the information they need because it's going to be um, it's going to be information from from not just one uh, provider, but from several providers, yeah. and they're going to look at how many residences in a particular town aren't served by this particular company, and it's going to take a, a lot more legwork to determine which grants are should be awarded or which money should be awarded to which companies. So he didn't feel it was going to be enough time. That's why this is. Hmm. Um, so they are working on it. They're hopeful that that they can get this thing moving. And and uh, he asked if if uh, he said make sure that our provider, uh, the local provider, sends all the information as far as how many houses and residents in Canterbury don't have it. And, and I said, yep, they they have in the past two grant applications, and they will in future grants. So that's where we are with broadband. It's uh, unfortunately still a waiting game. Yeah. Um, our Comcast uh, representative is still adamant that Canterbury is on the top of their list. Once uh, this grant money gets distributed, if they are one of the reception or the receipt people, then they will certainly come to Canterbury. So, so is there anything we need to sweeten the pot with or threaten with? or? Do anything like that? Or? Nope. I, 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 according to this uh, gentleman from the uh, economic division, administration division, um, they are waiting on on the federal government for the mm -hmm. final rules. Okay. And he said that when they do, they will distribute the money accordingly to who they feel, or suggest to the governor or council who they feel the, the best providers are to supply the, the expansion. So, and he feels it will be multiple companies. That's it. His opinion is it will be multiple companies. Uh, but that's his thought that I don't know where that's going to go. So. Ken, has there been any response from the any town residents on that? Committee? There has not. I have not gotten any, gotten any uh, response from anybody that's interested in being on the committee. Okay. <laughs> Trying to beat the bushes. They went out on town email. Talk to me about it. went no town email and the newsletter and, and yeah. it's on the website and mm -hmm. but that's I haven't gotten anybody. So. All right. I know. Uh, the next is the hazard, hazard mitigation plan it was approved. I have the approval here. Um, thank you very much for your signatures and getting all that paperwork done on, in time but at our last meeting and. Um, they will be sending us bound copies. We have electronic copy, and they'll be sending us bound copies. So, um, good work. And, and thank you to yeah. all everybody yeah. that, that helped do that. I think that uh, Central New Hampshire Planning Commission uh, certainly earned their 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 money on that one. Yeah. Um, so, thank you. Yes. Yes. Stephanie is uh, at Central New Hampshire Planning was really mm -hmm. quite well. Um, uh, upgrade, update on the baler. Um, the baler is installed and running yeah. up at the transfer station. Um, they, they produce some bales with it, both mixed paper and cardboard. Uh, the highway department is helping out with the baling up there on Tuesdays since uh, uh, we're still short staffed up there. Um, and they will continue to do that. Uh, the plan is that on Tuesdays, the highway guys will go up uh, for a few hours in the morning and, and assist the, the transfer station staff. So, um, the latest uh, I got from Northeast Resource Recovery on costs or revenue, um, loose cardboard is, um, the cost is uh, five to ten dollars a ton. Bailed cardboard is twenty to fifty dollars revenue, hmm. so uh, we stand to, to actually make some pretty decent money on that if that market stays where it is. Yeah. Um, we'll see. Uh, mixed paper loose is twenty five to sixty dollars a ton. Bailed it's twenty five dollars cost to ten dollars revenue depending on the on the, the uh, market. Uh, and 
just as an aside, glass is still 40 to 48 dollars a ton that we have to pay to get rid of it. Yeah. Um, we crush it here, we transport it by truck out to, um, I think it's uh, Lebanon or Hanover, <coughs> one of their facilities out there takes it, and, uh, and but we have to pay to, to get it down there. Do have some price sheets. Oh, one thing came up as far as tires, truck tires, large truck tires. We have a price sheet up there that says tires, it's five dollars, and we have some large truck tires drop off. Um, couldn't really charge them anymore. Mm. Um, one of their, one of the NRRA's vendors uh, for truck trailer over 19 inch, uh, estimated 45 pounds is 21 dollars. Um, but they have a 50 tire minimum pickup. So um, I know that uh, we got word from um, Loudon that their vendor, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure who it is, uh, charges quite a bit more than that. And I'm not sure of, of the details on that, but uh, John O'Connor is gonna look at, talk to different uh, vendors and maybe some tire dealers in the area to see what the costs are. And if we <coughs> send the big tires to maybe a, a truck tire place to see if they'll take it for us. So. Uh, let's see, we did a cybersecurity audit with Primex, um, our insurance company. Um, it was a questionnaire that we filled out. Cybertron, our IT provider, sat with us through it. Um, we have some exposures in some areas and not a lot of exposures in other areas. Um, we are going to do a um, CISA audit, which is a CISSA. Uh, there's a company that provides that to us uh, free of charge, um, and they will offer us recommendations and uh, on, on what we have to do. So I'm in email contact with Primex, their IT professional, and the gentleman from CISA to complete this audit and recommendations uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, Primex is our insurance provider, says this is our recommendations. There's no requirement that we follow them, but in some cases they are very good recommendations and, and fairly easy to establish. So uh, we're doing, we're actually doing pretty good. Uh, we have offsite backup. It's it's uh, done every night. Um, they re recommend checking it, uh, checking it every week. We check it every month. Um, it's you know they're not going to push on something like that. No. Um, <coughs> we still issue paper checks, so we don't have any issues with uh, electronic payments. The only electronic payments we do is through payroll, and that requires uh, uh, two people with a FOB. Each person has to have a FOB, uh, one to submit the, the payroll, and one to approve it. So uh, there's fairly, fairly high security there. Um, being a small town, any, any requests for changes of uh, direct deposit or anything like that have to be backed up either in writing or at the very least a phone call. But yeah. right now it's <coughs> any any changes in healthcare or, or bank accounts or anything like that, uh, Jan has asked, told the department heads, they get writing. Yeah. So, um, so we're not, we're, our, our risk is low in a lot of these areas. So, um, so we did pretty good with that. Uh, had, we are in the process of our financial audit with Fonsick and Sanderson. Um, they came out last Wednesday and Thursday, did a bunch of field work. They were there both days all day. Um, things are going fairly smoothly. The staff at the town office is uh, working with them on any questions. Um, and they are coming back for another two day field work in this month in May. They have two days scheduled, they'll probably hopefully only need one day, but then that, that financial audit will be, will be done. Um, so 
busy, busy times at the town office. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, there was Rachel was in from the library last month and talked about the door. Yeah. They they gave us a whole list from the historic society. One of them was the door. We had a uh, she finally did get a proposal for a door for full replacement was seventy eight hundred dollars. Um, I went down with our building inspector and we looked at it. Yeah. He made some uh, suggestions and uh, we got another contractor to come in to look at it to make some, uh, some repairs instead of a full replacement, mm -hmm. which uh, Joel, uh, who's the building inspector, code enforcement officer, as well as a contractor, yeah. looked at it and said, well, these are the things you should do, and, and that should take care of the problem. And uh, so there's another contractor that came and looked at it, and we're waiting for his estimates on it. Um, also looked at the heat issue in the building, and Joel made some suggestions that were fairly inexpensive. So we're gonna look at those. Um, so I think we're, we're looking at that list of, of issues there. Uh, we did have a HVAC technician came in and I explained he didn't have a ladder with him. The weather has been such when he has time to come that he really didn't want to get up on the roof and do some uh, diagnostics. So he's waiting for the weather to clear up a little bit. And when it does, he'll come back and, and try and diagnose that, that unit on the roof. So uh, we're working on, on getting that list taken care of. Um, flag in the center. Uh, we have some proposals. I sent some proposal around. Yep. Um, I got another proposal today from Flagworks over America, which is in Concord, on an aluminum pole. Uh, I talked to Kent about the fiberglass pole. He talked to Dale Caswell, and they were kind of had their hopes set on an aluminum pole. Um, we have an estimate um, from Flagworks for a 30 foot aluminum pole for $2,010 and freight is $527.85 so 25 dollars 85 would be the cost of the pole. That's not installing it, that's just getting it near to the center. Uh, there's a cost uh, which we don't have yet on the base which is a concrete base um, that's being made by a concrete company with a five inch sleeve in it, uh, which is required for the, that size pole. Um, I don't know, I, John said he was gonna get an estimate for me. He, he thought it'd be a few hundred dollars, so. Um, and then I, I, I'm assuming our highway department can, they can put the base in and I don't know if we can get uh, Brian Goon to help set it with his crane truck or something like that, so. Now this uh, pole comes with all the equipment. comes with all the ropes, the hall halyards, equipment, everything. Everything is needed. We just have to set it up. Nice brass ball on the top. Or? I, I don't believe it's brass, but it's gold. gold. I don't I don't mm. know what the material is. <laughs> I want to it's not it there. it's not the it's not the styrofoam um, <laughs> Christmas decoration ball that we painted gold with a spray can for that old pole. But it held up for a lot of years. <laughs> so um, I just that that money I just want your approval to go ahead and spend that money for that pole. So I'm ordering. It's a four to six week delivery. We're not gonna get it done Memorial Day, but um, I just want your approval to, to get that. Can I jump in here since we're talking about Memorial Day for a second, or do you want to finish? Well, let me know about this. You guys okay? Oh, yes. 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 All right. Okay. <laughs> I approve. I said yes. <laughs> okay. Um, go ahead about Memorial Day. So uh, Mark talked to me. He would like to. He's in my place too. Okay. So, so yeah. he'd like to have so I can walk down. You're in town. Uh, patriotic uniform is acceptable, so I wore red, white, blue last year. You know, but your uniform probably will. Yeah. That's yeah. We don't have. He wanted us to lay the wreath, so I said yes. We take care of that. No. Um, what what? Whatever Memorial Day is. 
Contract. One of the things that came up in the IT audit was uh, the, the contract with our IT provider Cybertron had lapsed, and uh, I have a new one here. Um, so I don't know. It, it basically, it, it's what we presented to Cybertron for. They gave us a price, and we said yes. Uh, it's ten thousand dollars for the. Computer network services for the year, and then the fire department, highway department, and, and uh, police department are on needed as as requested. An hourly rate of one hundred twenty-five dollars an hour. So I have the contract here. There's one place for a signature. Cheryl, do you want to sign this? Sure. Okay. security camera company that uh, was asked about what we had for security cameras and if we're interested in getting more security cameras in here and other buildings. I explained to them that at our middle school building we have a system in place up there that works pretty good. Uh, one of the things when we were building or rebuilding the new Sand Lake house was a security system. We were going to plan on putting a, a video security system in there. But because of some cost overruns and everything, we cut that out of the budget. Um, the comp this company is called Verkada, V-E-R-K-A-D-A. -A. Um, it's a one platform for all of our security needs, according to them. Um, I explained to them we have a fairly robust burglar system, fire alarm system in the building, so all we're looking for really is video. Um, and so they gave us a proposal. They are sending us two cameras, one interior and one exterior, for a 30-day free trial. And uh, they're going to be in the area. They can install them for us. It's a web-based um, security system. There's no DVR with it. So all the information goes to the camera. And uh, anything can be, it can be all viewed and controlled from any internet uh, access point. So um, so what's it do? Delete the last days? It's a 30 day uh, coverage, uh, retainer, whatever. Um, you can get more if you want, but the typical they, they do 30 days. Yeah. Um, <coughs> it's, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly advanced technological um, system that allows the user to uh, program all sorts of things into the video. Uh, if you are looking for a particular incident, um, instead of trying to scroll through all sorts of video, days and days of video, to find maybe a red car or a white car or a particular person, you can put uh, information into the program and it will search out. If you say, I want all white cars in this 30 day period, it'll bring up the white cars. Hmm. Um, same thing if you, uh, uh, license plate readers are not legal in New Hampshire, um, so it does based on color of the vehicles, yeah. um, things like that. 
sedans, different different body types, trucks, vans, things like that. It can differentiate between. Um, if you have a picture of someone that uh, you want to know how many times they visited the town office, you can put that picture into the program and it will search uh, the, the program. It will take likenesses and hmm. based on facial recognition uh, and show you how many times a person with that likeness has come into the building or when they were there. Um, so it's fairly advanced. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the system. Like I say, they give us a 30-day free trial. Um, they suggest six cameras for our building. Um, which they have uh, uh, cameras now that are a, they're being replaced with a newer model. So they have these, he didn't want to say older cameras, but he said the, the current technology cameras, the newer technology cameras will be coming out in a year or so. He said right now they're running a special on these cameras. I, I explained to him that we don't have, we don't have a budget for this. Um, that would probably give me a year, and he said he's worked with other towns uh, for putting things off. Um, but uh, cost is between um, fifty-five and hundred and six thousand dollars for six cameras and a and a five-year um, a five-year license because you have to. It's a five hundred dollar cost for a license every year. A little over five. A little over five. Can you say those prices again? So, the cost of the, the cost of the cameras is would be five thousand nine hundred and two dollars and seventy eight cents with a five year license. Okay. So, um, that's what that's what he feels would would set the town of us the Sand Lake House up for for that system. Um, again, I told him, you know what, bring the cameras up. Set them up, give us 30 days. And he said, if you choose not to buy them afterwards, that's fine. Just we pay freight both ways, take them down and ship them mm -hmm. back to us. He said, it takes a Cat 5 cable and, and that's all it takes. Um, so, and power. So he's going to come up and hook them up. Um, so I said, sure, bring them up and we'll try them out and see what happens. Um, I figured the, at the very least, we could try it out and see if we like that system. And if, if that's something that we think we should have, need to have, whatever, then at least we have an idea of what a cost is and, and what, what the cameras. Um, I know the cameras up at the municipal building run off of a DVR. Um, and again, it's on a 30 day. <coughs> it does not have, uh, it's certainly not as technologically advanced as, as this one is. You can zoom in. He gave me a whole. Uh, presentation. It was a 45-minute uh, virtual presentation of zooming in on, on things. And the picture is unbelievably clear. I just I was like, I can't believe this. You know? mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, I just figured I'd let you guys know, okay. um, and I'll keep you posted on, on what's happening with that. Uh, okay. This one... That's the new baler. I forgot to bring up as part of the baler. We need to send, we got that grant for just over $4,000, $4,340, the baler from New Hampshire Beautiful. In order to get that grant, uh, in order to get the check, we have to send them a letter saying that the baler's in and thank you very much and this is what it's gonna, what it's gonna do, and pictures. So I got pictures of the baler in action the other day. And I have a letter. For you guys to sign, uh, basically says, Town of Canterbury received and put in operation the new vertical downstroke baler. Um, we have the ability to produce large commercially accepted bales, cardboard, mixed paper, plastic, aluminum. With the downturn of the recycling markets, the addition of this bale will allow the town to spend less on shipping and recycling costs and produce income for some products. Thank you, Atlantic Recycling, <coughs> the equipment and training, Larry Martin Electric for the new wiring. Canterbury Solid Waste Committee for the work on the project, Canterbury Highway Department, and the staff of the transfer station. And we also want to thank the board of New Hampshire Beautiful for the grant to help offset expenses for the email. So that is a place for your signatures.
the least. Uh, our assessor came to me today um, with a fairly uh, complicated and significant issue. Um, any organization that re requests a religious or other exemption from taxes has to file a uh, application for that exemption, tax exemption, once a year by April 15th. Um, there's an RSA, um, she included it, uh, 72 colon 23-C, and uh, here's the, there's the application right here. Um, there are three properties, three organizations in town that have properties that have not filed for this year. Um, we have in the past tried to chase these organizations to make sure they file on time. Um, there's no requirement for the town to do that. Uh, they, they did file last year. Um, this year they haven't filed. There was a Supreme Court case um, that found that says, the finding from the court case says, when the taxpayer fails to file a timely annual application for such an exemption, no evidence exists the late filing was due to excusable accident, mistake, or misfortune. The Supreme Court made it clear that the exemption application must be denied by the selectmen, even if there is a prior history of granting the exemption. So, that means the town must send out tax bills to these organizations. Um, one is the uh, Buell Fellowship up on Shaker Road. Yep. One is the Carol's Earth uh, organization on Foster Road. And one is the Canterbury United Community Church. Uh, now, this is, this is, we're going to have to send, we have to send the, the letters out, you right. know, saying we owe these taxes. Um, this is going to be um, a problem. Yeah. I think that my, my guess is they will ask for a date, which certain guys can but I also feel that these organizations have been around for a long time and have been have have been have to chase them for this. And it's not a, I mean, the paperwork is it's a simple one-page document. And um, at what point do does the town expect its employees to to chase after organizations? Um, to be tax exempt. Right. <laughs> Especially the town part time employees. Yeah, yeah. So, I, and, and maybe this letter will be a wake up call to them, I hope. But again, um, we have to send those bills out. So I just want you guys to be aware okay. that that's happening. And I, on Wednesday, this was brought to me a little late in the day. What I'd like to do is have your permission. Uh, to make some phone calls to let them know that these letters are coming out, uh, or at least some kind of communication okay. beforehand yeah. to let them know that the bill is in the mail okay. and that that uh, you know uh, there is a court supreme 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 court of New Hampshire ruled that the towns have to bill you, and there have been cases there. There's there's case law here and and information from the. New Hampshire Board of Tax and Land Appeals that holds the assessors responsible. And in one case, one assessor was almost lost his license. Hmm. So it doesn't just mean that, <clears throat> that, oh, well, my dad will submit this. It means that our assessor could potentially lose their license. Right. And then we would, the town would be in, in, problem. So 
um, the ramification just isn't on a, a tax exempt organization that that fails to get their paperwork in on time and do whatever why it has has some other uh, considerations to be filed. So uh, sounds good to me. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I I said to Mandy, this is going to ruffle some feathers. Yep. <laughs> but Absolutely. I want you guys to be aware. And I, I will certainly make make the attempt to make some contact with the, these organizations and let them know. Okay. But that's all I got. Uh, we did get one resume in so far for the administrative assistant position. It came in today. Cool. Um, it looked promising. Yep. The ad was in the copy monitor Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, nothing so far on the transfer station manager, those yeah. that has been posted. Um, but we'll see what happens. Okay. And uh, the uh, transfer station attendant that was going to be out on uh, injury for a while, that surgery has been put off. Yeah. Um, they don't have a date yet. So he's got some other health issues that have required the surgery to be put off. So. So are we short a person, or are we, is he still? He, he is on restricted duty. Uh, he can't lift over twenty pounds, I think. Yeah, so um, hmm. we're still having uh, one of the highway department employees up there on all the time on Saturdays, and um, if he can't make it, he, he's going on vacation for a few weeks. So we've offered offered it out, and if he can, we'll get. Uh, Tony's volunteering out there. Well, that's right. Uh, hmm. Yes, uh, we had a resident, uh, Tony Abbott, that has had a, uh, asked if he could volunteer up there, and uh, he is. He started, came in last Saturday, so Wednesday, whatever it was. Saturday. Saturday. He worked, worked for a few hours up there, and um, is, we're thinking that he can be helpful with directing people to the right place. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, he has some, I think, some physical limitations, but but at the same time, he can answer questions and things like that. Yeah. And he's a volunteer. So. Yeah. Should we use him on the corrugated trash? To the yeah, I I didn't. I was gonna find out how it went with the solid waste committee because they're a little more knowledgeable about that. Yeah. But I didn't know, mm -hmm. and we'd see where we needed. So we had polls. Steve up there a week ago, Saturday. So uh -huh. He was up there for three, four hours maybe. And then uh, and, and people don't know what they're doing up there, right? They're just throwing yeah. what they think is cardboard in there and it's not. So yeah. I don't know how long we'll have to do it to see a difference in the output of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, it's, it's an education yeah. for, for the residents. And um, if it can be explained in a way that lets them know that, um, you know, the, the cost of a of a bale of cardboard uh, versus mixed paper is quite a difference. Yeah. And, and it took them, I think it was three hours to do the first bale yeah. because they had to sort through everything. And it took them, he said, four or five garbage cans of mixed paper they had to take out of the cardboard yeah. in order to do it. Um, so it took quite a while. And, and certainly that, that cuts down on the revenue because yeah. it's, it's time spent, it's yep. labor hours. Yep. But but if we can educate the residents a little bit better and, and have that reduced, then that, that's more income. Was yeah. there any of the things they noticed coming through that cardboard pile that, I don't know, grease, stuff on the paper, any nothing? Okay. Well, I don't, they, they just said that they had to sort and they had a lot of mixed paper that was in there okay. that wasn't, what would would not be accepted as a as a bale of, of uh, cardboard? Yeah. 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 Do you have anything? I'm right wrong. Me too. Thank You're ready for next week. So we'll go at that too. Adjourned. Thank you. On to the next one. Oh.